welcome back to one stop law in our previous lectures we have covered the first three elements that vitiate free consent to a contract in this lecture we will look into the fourth element that is the factor of misrepresentation now before going into the uh, statutory definition of misrepresentation under section 18 of the indian contract act let us quickly understand the concept of misrepresentation in general I, you can see i have given you a flow chart where it is provided that misrepresentation is basically making a false representation of a fact made innocently honestly believing it to be true so this is most important that where a statement is made which is false undoubtedly the statement is false but the statement the false statement is stated innocently and without any intention or making it innocently honestly believing believing it to be true that is the person who makes the statement he himself believes it to be true completely unknown of the fact that the statement is untrue so the statement is made innocently believing it to be true without any intention to deceive the other party to whom it is made so this is very important the intention to deceive is missing here the person who is making this false statement he himself believes it to be true and he has no intention to deceive the person to whom he is stating this uh, statement okay making this statement so basically misrepresentation is misstatement of a fact but this misstatement is innocent misstatement that the person making the statement himself believes it to be true and he does not have any intention to deceive the person to whom he is making this statement now if we quickly look into the uh, statutory definition of misrepresentation as provided under section 18 you can see i have underlined the key points under the section we can see that basically under section 18 misrepresentation can be committed by three ways if you remember in our previous lecture we had studied fraud can be committed by five ways here we see misrepresentation can be committed by three ways number 1 it is the positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it of that which is not true though he believes it to be true so firstly it can be done by making a positive assertion of a statement so basically one asserts something a person states something positively and which he believes it to be true not knowing it to be untrue that is the person making the statement he himself believes that statement to be true and he himself has no knowledge that the statement is untrue that is why you see it is written in a manner not warranted so basically this is an unwarranted statement okay unwarranted here means the person making the statement making this false statement has not verified the source of information okay he has not verified its truthfulness he believes it to be true therefore he states it to someone else he does not goes and cross check the truthfulness of the information or the statement this is meant this is meant by positive assertion in a manner not warranted that is basically positively asserting a a statement which is unwarranted number 2 what happens then it is it can be done where there is any breach of duty which without an intent to deceive gains an advantage to the person committing it or any one claiming under him by misleading another to his prejudice or to the prejudice of any one claiming under him so second see the person has made a positive assertion okay which is unwarranted now if it is unwarranted if he has not cross checked the truthfulness of the information that means what he has done he has done a breach of duty on his part that means he has not exercised his uh, duty to take care properly he should have cross checked the truthfulness of the information so there is a breach of duty on his part and what can be the outcome of this breach of duty that is either the person making the statement gains an advantage from it or any person other than this um, the person making it can be any other person gaining some advantage because of this misstatement and ultimately the person to whom it is made he is prejudiced he is misled okay and the third point the third method causing however innocently a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which is the subject of the agreement so out out of this everything the outcome is that the party who has entered into this agreement the misstatement uh, based on which he entered into this contract was very material as to the subject matter of the agreement i will give you an example suppose a wants to sell a car, car to b and a says to b that 
see this is my car this is in a condition of you know almost brand new it had never met with an accident and it had no damage it has no damages a says all these things to b okay now a honestly believes it your his car to be you know in that position because he knows that his car has never met with an accident and there is no damage but what a was not aware of that once you know his son took the car out and he had met with an accident and there is some damages okay in his car a was completely unaware of this fact but this is his breach of duty he should have cross checked because based on this fact only b will enter into the contract now this is a fact which is material to the subject of the contract b sees that here he is getting a car which has not met with an accident and which is damage free so he enters into the contract a gains something from it a okay a, a definitely gets the sell price of the car and this is his advantage and b is prejudiced how because he pays for a car which had met with an accident and which had some damages but the the central point here is that here a has made this misstatement innocently he never knew that the car met with an accident or it had some damages so he had no intention to deceive b he he told b whatever he believed and this is all about misrepresentation now if we quickly look into the requirements of misrepresentation number 1 it must be a representation of a material fact mere expression of opinion does not amount to misrepresentation so if it is just about an opinion okay suppose b had come to a about buying of a car and a said that okay i have a car um, you can consider it like it is damage free so here no concrete discussion or concrete assertion is given by a b came for an inquiry and a just gave his opinion that he has a car so here it will not be considered as misrepresentation number 2 it must be made before the conclusion of the contract with a view to inducing the other party to enter into the contract very important it must be made this misstatement this false statement must be made before the contract is entered into and not afterwards because based on this statement only the person should have made up his mind to enter into the contract number 3 it must be made with the intention that it should be acted upon by the person to whom it is addressed similarly if the suppose a had told b that i want to sell a car which is damage free which had never met with an accident b listens to it goes to home and sleeps okay no this is not misrepresentation because b never acted upon a's statement in order to constitute misrepresentation the person to whom it is conveyed that statement must have been acted upon by that person or someone else number 4 it must actually have been acted upon or must have been induced to the contract and number 5 it must be wrong okay it must be wrong but the person who made it honestly believed it to be true so the statement must be false if the statement turns out to be true suppose in this case actually there was no accident done with this car or it had no damages then a statement is never false and it will not be a case of misrepresentation so the statement made must be a wrong one a false one number 6 it must be made without any intention to deceive the other party this is the key element of distinction between fraud and misrepresentation you see in both cases of fraud and misrepresentation there is a false statement made okay in fraud also we learn that a false information is given a statement is given or a truth is concealed with an intention to deceive someone now this intention to deceive is key in in case of misrepresentation again there is a false statement made but here the person making the statement believes it to be true and he has no intention absolutely no intention to deceive or cheat someone this is the key element of distinction between fraud and misrepresentation number 6 i just told you number 7 it need not be made directly to the plaintiff a wrong statement uh, of uh, facts made to a third person with the intention of communicating it to plaintiff is also amounts to misrepresentation so i just gave you example a want to selling its car to b suppose consider the same fact in a different situation a just told b that he has a car for sale and that car is you know uh, without any damage or it had never met with an accident b did not want to buy any car but suppose tomorrow c was enquiring about a car with b that i want to buy a car so b gave this information to c that you know yesterday only a was telling me he has this car which is completely damage free and which has never met with an accident so now c comes to a to buy this car 
see the basis of this contract between A and C will be ultimately that misstatement which A had told B. So, here even if the contract is between A and C, the basis of the false statement is made by A. So, this is also the similar case, same case of misrepresentation. I just gave you an example of this selling of car between A and B. Let us look into another example. A while selling his mayor to B tells him that the mayor is thoroughly sound. A genuinely believes the mayor to be sound although he has no sufficient ground for the belief. So here A wanted to sell a mayor which he believed to be sound. But what A has not done, he has not cross checked the soundness of the mayor. Okay, He believes it to be sound so he went to sell it to B. Okay, So this is basically an unwarranted statement by A on the soundness of the mayor. So later on B finds that the mayor to be unsound. So later on it was an advantage to A. He got the price and B was prejudiced because he got ultimately an unsound mayor. So here in this case the representation made by A is a misrepresentation Y. He had made a false statement, a misstatement as to the soundness of the mayor. But the very important fact here is that he made it without any intention to deceive. Rather he himself believed the mayor to be sound. This is a case of misrepresentation. So this is all for this video. In our next video we will sum up misrepresentation and we will do a very landmark case study on misrepresentation.